Dr. Jonathan Mann first encountered HIV and AIDS in Central Africa in the early 80s. He was one of the first medical researchers to understand the world was facing a new global pandemic. In 1986, he started to develop the World Health Organization's global program on AIDS in Geneva. The program became the first worldwide effort to halt the pandemic and it quickly achieved a global impact. Jonathan Mann at the time was, was really a visionary in that he saw HIV through a different lens. Well, the great uh, merit of, of, of Jonathan Mann was to put AIDS on the world map. He was one of the real charismatic people I've met in my life. I think he had an understanding and brought about the humanity of the disease. It could have been very easy for a Jonathan Mann to be talking science. He sort of lifted HIV AIDS into people's real life. He helped put HIV on the world agenda and mobilize truly generations of people. Mr. Mann, um, you are um, talking about three phases in the history of AIDS. Could you just uh, very briefly? Actually, four. Uh, the first phase started sometime in the mid-1970s. We're not sure where, and I'm not sure that really matters very much. The first phase was the silent phase. It's when the AIDS virus was circulating around the world, silently, unnoticed, undetected. The second phase, the phase of discovery, occurred between 1981 and 1985. That's when we learned the virus, its name, how it spread, and that it was a world problem. The third phase, from 85 to 80, the beginning of 88, is the phase of global mobilization, where we have seen a more rapid and more extensive, a really unprecedented mobilization of global energy and resources to fight a disease than has ever been seen before in history. So now we enter the fourth period that began, began symbolically uh, sometime in early 1988. Where exactly will that lead? What is the name of that period? I don't know. He looked at HIV as a human rights issue, an issue of human rights in general and particularly rights among women because he saw what was going on in developing nations. See, what AIDS has done in every society is to unveil and exacerbate previously existing social conflicts. The threat is a, is a rather diffuse threat. It isn't one individual you can point to. It's a rather diffuse threat. And faced with a diffuse threat, one of the reactions of society is to just go back to whatever they were previously upset about, whether that's prejudice about race or religion or national origin or sex, and to exacerbate that. So the people from country A blame country B, and the people in country B blame, blame country A. That's the old finger-pointing story of the French disease, the Italian disease, the Spanish disease of syphilis. But also within societies, there's a, a kind of pressure that's put on the society, and those who are disadvantaged, the prejudice emerges again. When in 1986, must have been August 1986, I walked into, into Jonathan Mann's office. It was a tiny cubicle in the office, and he had then one secretary and one typewriter. That was basically all the resources he had been given to uh, undertake a meaningful response to HIV globally. Uh, fortunately, the, the, the program and the budget would grow significantly over the following years. Within two years, Jonathan had been able to mobilize a budget of $70 million a year. What was essentially accomplished during 1985 through early 1988 is first that an agenda was established. We described AIDS in a way that focused upon not only the virus, but on the social and political and cultural and economic impact of AIDS. We, we explained AIDS to the world, if you will, as a development problem, not just a medical problem. He, Jonathan was a, a shy person. He was a person who was, at times, afraid. He was a person who was afraid of high-rise buildings. And you would see this uh, difficulty that Jonathan had at times to cope with the outside world. 
and he would walk along with him, crossing those streets that would make him uncomfortable, to a conference hall where Jonathan would walk in and address a population of 20,000 people without hesitation, without any fear. I would like to welcome you as chair of the 8th International Conference on AIDS, the third World STD Congress. You know, one of the things that uh, I've learned about Jonathan from knowing his children and from studying his writings and, and knowing people who worked with him is that for him, connecting health and human rights was a very practical issue. It wasn't a matter of making a, a um, philosophical argument about health as a human right or even a legal argument about health as a human right. It was his effort to protect the poorest of the poor. What he said is that it's the most vulnerable and marginalized sectors in society that are uh, affected the first by this epidemic. And so we've got to make sure that their rights are being protected and being strengthened. I'm always extremely impressed with the human quality of the people who have risen to the challenge of AIDS in countries around the world. In almost every country, maybe every country, Look at the people who are doing the AIDS work in different countries. It's, an it's really an extraordinary group of people. After leaving the World Health Organization in 1990, Jonathan Mann moved to Boston. He established the François-Xavier Bagnou Center for Health and Human Rights at the Harvard School of Public Health. On September 2, 1998, Jonathan Mann and his wife Mary Lou Clemens Mann tragically died in a Swiss airplane crash on their way to Geneva. There were no survivors. Today, in 2008, 10 years after his tragical death, uh, his ideas are still very important and they are very useful whenever we work with, with prevention or with care or with treatment, I, I would say, because he had this holistic perspective. And uh, the holistic perspective is the best way to fight a disease like AIDS. HIV and AIDS have shown the whole world, even more than the world wars, that we have to do something about human rights. We have to do something about humanity, and we have to become human again. Now that I studied the issue, the connections between violence against women and HIV, I can tell you that so evident that we cannot avoid working on that. Compassion is a major tool against AIDS, not discrimination. And I think that we can overcome AIDS. If every child is given a chance to understand AIDS from a very young age. When children are young like this, we, they need to be taught about HIV and AIDS as early as this age, so that when they grow up, they can take responsibility of themselves and the community as a whole. See, I would say that there's always been a human rights dimension to malaria and diarrheal disease and immunization and smallpox. But it was never really understood, it was never really seen. And yet with AIDS, we see perfectly clearly that if we don't protect the rights of those who are infected, we endanger us all. That the rights of everyone are protected by ensuring that the rights of some are protected. <laughs>